been a crazy last 24 hours with a ton of hardware news. We've already covered Intel, AMD, and NVIDIA. Those videos are on the channel if you want to see what's happening in the silicon space. But there's still more news from Intel. There's news from all the other companies in the space as well, of course. So we'll be going over that and recapping some of the most important stuff to pay attention to. As always, the first week or two of the year, there's a flood of news in the hardware industry. So a lot to catch up on. Let's get started. Before that, this video is brought to you by Asus and the ROG Crosshair 8 series of X570 motherboards for AMD. Asus has both the Crosshair 8 Hero Dark and the Crosshair 8 Extreme available, offering high-end motherboards for high core count AMD systems. We've used the Crosshair series for years for everything from basic overclocking up to liquid nitrogen overclocking, and we found them easy to work with, particularly for their extremely well-organized BIOS menus. Learn more at the link in the description below. All right, first up, Intel is back in the news. We already did a separate piece on the Intel CPU and mobile plans, some of the laminar cooler plans. This is different, though. Intel's 2022 live stream also included news on its Arc GPUs, just a little bit, though. Specifically, Intel was talking about its mobile line. Uh, Intel still says that Arc discrete GPUs are coming in quarter one of 2022. It's sticking to that date. And it says that has already shipped ARC GPUs in DGPU form or discrete GPU form to its OEMs. A lot of acronyms and initialisms in that sentence, but you get the idea. Intel said, quote, for 12th gen Core H series mobile designs, there are already GPUs going to OEMs. That means laptops, though. It's not really what we're looking for as desktop enthusiasts, but it's a start and we'll take it. As a quick reminder, too, these are separate from the DG1 that we previously reviewed, which was a one-off project card preceding the DG2 gaming cards we actually care about. At this time, Intel hasn't released any core details on the product specs, pricing, really the names beyond the code names that are out there now, like Alchemist. So we are lacking actual details, core counts, TDPs, memory capacity, all that is still lacking. Uh, we have a little bit to go off of, though. So despite these being soldered for laptops, these laptop GPUs are still discrete in the sense that they're separate from the CPUs. The CPUs might still have their own integrated GPUs as well. It depends on which model you're looking at. And IGPs, when they exist, installed alongside DGPUs, are often underutilized. That brings us to the next discussion point, though. Intel talked about its Intel Deep Link, as it calls it. There are a few features included in the Deep Link umbrella, like uh, what Intel calls dynamic power share, and there are some battery life optimizations. But the one that actually sounds interesting is hyper-encode. The concept is that rather than rendering one frame of a video at a time, frames can be automatically divvied up between the Intel IGP and the Intel DGPU to accelerate rendering. This isn't mind-blowing, but it does sound like a good way to get more use out of IGPs and a convenient way to divide render workloads without manually chopping them up. Intel saved a slightly underwhelming reveal for the end of the presentation. That's XESS, which we've already covered, but just a quick refresh for you. It's Intel's AI-enhanced upscaling. It's more similar to DLSS than FSR. FSR lacks the ground truth images and deep learning that DLSS uses, but it's more scalable and applicable to more games. So it's kind of, they have different advantages. FSR is useful because more widely applicable, and DLSS, in theory, is more accurate uh, or potentially gets a better result. Anyway, Intel has its own version of this, XESS. It's previously announced, but Intel had something to say about it, which is that it is finally coming to a couple of games. XESS is intended for, quote, wide availability on many games across a broad set of shipping hardware from both Intel and other GPU vendors. The main requirement is shader model 6.4 support. According to Intel, the, quote, XESS algorithm can leverage the DP4A and XMX hardware capabilities of XE GPUs for better performance. The headliner was the PC release of Death Stranding, which included an amusingly offhand reveal that the director's cut is coming to PC. Other titles confirmed include Hitman 3, The Rift Breaker, and a few more that Intel didn't even bother reading out loud. Certainly different from Nvidia's presentation where it was game after game after game, uh, 30, 50 for a few seconds, and some more games. But we'll definitely take this approach over that one. Up next, the 12900KS. Might as well talk about the rest of the Intel stuff. Intel surprised us by slipping this one in at the last second for its CES 2022 presentation. The 12900KS is a specially binned 12900K. In the, there haven't been many KS SKUs in the past. 9900KS is the only one that jumps to mind immediately. But that was a limited run of a pre-binned 9900K. That's what the 12900K looks like it'll be as well. Intel's reveal demonstrated a 5.5 gigahertz out-of-box boost clock, likely one core there, 
and noted that the CPU will hold 5 gigahertz in more demanding all-core workloads like gaming scenarios. Intel specifically noted 5.2 gigahertz all-core during some of the gaming workloads in its presentation, with e-cores operating at 4 gigahertz during the tech demo. The CPU remains a 12900K otherwise, so the core count, the cache, all the specs, they're all the same as a 12900K, except for those frequency numbers. Power maybe will vary a little bit as well. OEMs will sell systems with the 12900KS by April, but DIY availability is still to be determined. Up next, HP, kicking it old school. If you built a water-cooled system any time before 2010 or so, you may have had an externally mounted radiator. These have mostly died at this point. There are a few holdouts, like the water-cooled Mora 3, but that one's actually kind of cool and deserves to stick around. The others, though, like the sort of back-mounted or top-mounted radiators, have largely disappeared at this point. HP has brought it back, though. In a really weird way, but they've brought it back. The company will be shipping a new pre-built gaming PC with a cooler that it calls the Cryo Chamber, really watering down the word cryo, literally, since we're talking about water cooling, and cryo is typically not used for things that are physically incapable by laws of physics of going below room ambient temperature. But anyway, it's called the Cryo Chamber. The chassis is a large 45-liter desktop. It'll be available standalone for DIY if you want it for that, and in pre-built OEM systems from HP. Depressingly, HP has included all of this fancy external radiator business on top of a chassis, which has the front completely, inexplicably choked off for no good reason. There's a bunch of glass and a small gap between front intake and the outside air, likely restricting the actual efficacy of the external radiator significantly. Why any company would do this, we're really not sure, but they seem to like doing it, where what HP has done is created a problem so that it can then solve that problem with a, an inelegant, extremely expensive, excessive, and overly complex solution that sounds good in marketing, but is really not going to be much better than just not using a sheet of glass in front of the three fans at the front of the case to begin with. But because we're doing that, uh, the three fans are not as effective as they could be, not anywhere close, and the top radiator is now maybe equaling out for what was hindered by HP to begin with. It just it seems like an over-engineered solution to a problem that didn't need to exist to what it is. But anyway, HP's graphic fortunately does help us out. It depicts, for example, air flowing through the glass into the chassis. So they've found a way to break the laws of physics as well. As for the radiator, it's basically bolted onto the top of the chassis and it runs its tubes down from above to the motherboard. This is actually a good thing uh, and the design isn't bad, but the fact that HP had to create the problem in order to create the solution is just disappointing. This could have been a lot cooler, both literally and just just cooler because it's an interesting design. It's it's a more uh, confined throwback to the older external radiator idea. It's kind of still internal because they've basically taken the case, bolted it to the top and an extension and put the radiator inside of that. So it's still internal in that sense, but kind of external. It could be really interesting, uh, just extremely poorly executed. And you know, when you're going for extreme high performance, it doesn't make any sense to also restrict the performance somewhere else because at best you're sort of meeting back in the middle where you should have been to begin with instead of having that extreme high performance that no one else is going to have in the space. So blown opportunity here if that's how it actually is going to ship. Uh, we are going to try and get one of these though. Uh, they look like they're going to ship for upwards of five grand if you custom kit it on HP's website, but we'll see what we can do. Either way, the system was shown with a 240 millimeter radiator externally. You could fit up to 360. Uh, and we're not sure about 280s at this point. We've been asking manufacturers to make more uniquely themed hardware since the Yustin Cute Pet video card. Eventually, this was followed by other hardware from Asus, where it did its own licensing, and now MSI is working on licensing of anime uh, IP for its hardware. Now, I'm not 100% sure how to pronounce this. I believe it's Jundum. I'm waiting for you to leave your comment in the, in the comments below. Uh, Asus did the Gundam hardware previously, and MSI is working on Evangelion. The G in Evangelion is pronounced the same way as the G in GIF. And to create as much pronunciation controversy as possible, MSI announced a few different components with the Evangelion branding. It announced an Evangelion liquid cooler, an Evangelion case, an Evangelion power supply, and an Evangelion motherboard. Do with that what you will, commenters. Asus did the same, except it also added a GPU, and those were all branded Gundam. 
I really hope people are like tensing up and cringing when I do that. Uh, the components are modified variants of existing MSI hardware, just like Asus did with the Gundam components. So these are not new things. They are painting them, giving them a facelift, and uh, branding them. And that's pretty much it. So not new stuff. If you find a review of the existing models of any of these components, uh, that review will remain accurate as far as the core uh, components of the hardware being reviewed. The case is the Gungnir 110R EVA. It's based on the incredibly poor design of the Gungnir cases previously, which are woefully restricted. The colors are the expected green and purple, with the right side panel featuring a painted white design and the left side panel featuring characters. The motherboard runs a purple accented set of heat sinks, but is otherwise identifiable as a brand new, actually, B660 Tomahawk board for Intel Alder Lake. As for the AIO, that's an MAG Core Liquid 240 mil AIO rebranded for Evangelion. The power supply is on the lower tier of things. It's 80 plus bronze in theory, and it's 650 watts. Up next, Thermal Take. Thermal Take has followed in step with LCDs on cases. We've looked at these maybe once or twice before in recent history. This is a rebrand of an existing chassis. It's the Divider 500TG with some changes. The main change is the addition of a 3.9 inch LCD front and center that can show GIFs or readout system information. So if you have good GIFs you want to show, you can put them on the LCD just like you can put good GIFs on AIOs like the Asus Ryugen previously. Or is it Asus Ryugen? Just gonna start a war at this point over one letter in the alphabet. The last chassis with an LCD that we covered in any capacity was the Ivypower Snowblind. This was much different though because the execution used an LCD on the side panel for video playback. Unfortunately, the 550TG Ultra suffers the same issues as many of the company's other cases right now by closing off all panels and restricting airflow to the fourth dimension. This is rather than utilizing the potential for a gigantic gaping hole somewhere in the case that has glass everywhere for the large three LED ornaments known to other manufacturers sometimes as fans that are located on the front of the case. The original Divider 500TG came out in July of 2021. Without a sample of the Ultra on hand, we're not completely certain whether the tooling has changed at all, but a cursory glance reveals that the 500TG and 550TG Ultra look pretty similar sans the addition of the LCD readout for system information and for uh, animated image files. Up next, MSI. MSI's poor laptop cooling and their fumbling attempts to cover up the fallout earned the whole company a prominent place on the 2020 Disappointment Tour t-shirt. So we were interested to see the new Stealth GS77 laptop revealed with a phase change liquid metal pad. We've actually worked on these in the past. Liquid metal pads are kind of interesting. Uh, there, there are reasons that they're not really implemented at large. In computer components, some of the ones we've worked on in the past have been abandoned by the companies that were starting to develop them or research them. But the idea is that uh, you can think of it sort of, it's just a liquid metal like you would normally see, except it almost liquefies and sort of solidifies depending on the temperature that it's currently sitting under, under the IHS. Liquid metal alloys and PCs are typically designed to have melting points below room temperature and cooling the metal to the point that it solidifies is something to be avoided. So no phase changing is involved in that capacity. This is why if you use liquid metal, for CPU cooling, and then you pour liquid nitrogen into an LN2 pot on top of it, it's actually far worse than using thermal paste, despite liquid metal having a much higher thermal conductivity at a higher temperature, but it scales down. So higher temperature is better for liquid metal, lower temperature basically solidifies it, renders it useless, especially once it's sub-zero. According to some reports from MSI's presentation, the GS77's pad will melt at 58 degrees Celsius. That's higher than the 30C melting point of unalloyed gallium, and well above room temperature. So MSI states that, quote, the phase transition prevents the heat conductor from crystallization. Other than that, details are scarce. MSI claims an extremely nebulous up to 10% better performance. Similar to some of AMD, Intel, and Nvidia's claims in its presentations, we don't actually know what that means. We don't know 10% better than what and in what unit of measurement. If they're talking about arbitrary scales like degrees Celsius and Fahrenheit, and 10% means different things in both of those, despite trying to represent the same thing. Uh, maybe they mean frequency, in which case they were running the system too hot to begin with. Anyway, we don't know what that means, but it's 10% better than something in some capacity with some variable and probably with some unit of measurement. Regardless, we'll actually be interested to see how this performs. Might not get one to review, but 
Uh, we'll keep an eye out on it. If it's interesting, we'll get, get one in and look at it just because liquid metal pads are kind of fun to look at. Rollout will be limited for now. Notebook check reports that MSI has not yet developed an automated process for this. Asus did that, for example, with normal liquid metal application, but this is different because it's a pad. So uh, they are applying pads by hand. That is going to limit the production significantly and obviously will affect the cost. Finally, one of the few materials right now not suffering from a global supply shortage is plastic. And that is why Alienware has developed a new solution to try and equalize the shortage of materials across all types of materials. And it's created a black hole to suck in all of the plastic around it and make the new concept Polaris. Yes, this external GPU box is made by Alienware. Alienware, the company which is very with the times and which has recently brought the world never before seen in-home streaming, has now further demonstrated its ability to read the room by introducing an enclosure for your extra GPU that you don't have. This comes from the same company that recently announced its new laptop concept, suspiciously similar to frameworks to reduce materials waste and environmental impact. We assume that's because they needed the plastic instead to make more Alienware computers. Like the R10 that we looked at previously, which is a couple of millimeters of plastic around a metal chassis. The external graphics enclosure connects with USB 4, so that's actually kind of interesting. USB 4 is soon shipping on several of the laptops that were revealed at the, uh, the keynotes over the past few days. It will also work with Thunderbolt 4 and 3. Externally, it's a large shell that blends one part Apple and one part Twilight Zone design motifs. So it looks nice and edgy. It's got two USB ports up front. It has an RJ45 2.5 gigabit Ethernet hookup on it as well. USB Type-C, some other USB ports on the back. Uh, internally, it lacks space for a power supply. So instead, you'll be running power bricks if you do end up buying one of these. The power bricks currently during the concept phase are two 330-watt or two 425-watt capable power bricks. Uh, it can fit GPUs at least a Founders Edition sizing, but we don't know the height capabilities right now for a video card. Anywhere made some comments as well about how the box will be liquid cooled with a 240 mil AIO. Once again, leaning on the word cryo a little overzealously. We're uncertain at this time what that actually means in the context of socketing an existing shrouded cooled GPU. That's it for this CES News Roundup. Let us know which ones you're the most interested in in the comments below. Maybe we'll look at some of this stuff, but there's a lot more coming out. We'll be talking especially about cases and motherboards as we learn more about them. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersaccess.net. If you'd like to grab one of our Disappointment Tour 2021 t-shirts, off to a great start for the new year. And you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus for behind the scenes videos. We'll see you all next time.